Very good. So welcome to this afternoon's session. Uh, we can have a couple of questions first and do some meditation. Yes. Okay. Um, this is a good one, actually. Poor lady. Um, oh, no, it's not that one. one minute. It's not poor lady. <laughs> it says, my roommate, my roommate snores very loudly, so I can't meditate in the mornings, even using earplugs. <laughs> Should I learn to tolerate the noise or should I find a new roommate? <laughs> <laughs> One of the monks boating down the monastery, his brother was visiting from Europe. There's no space for anything over there, even if uh, the most holiest person in the world came to boating down the monastery, you wouldn't be able to find a space for them. So. I said, well, there's no place for him to stay, your brother. He said, we grew up together. We can stay in the same room. I said, look at your age. How old is your brother? Guaranteed, both of you will snore. But, he said, I will, you know, my brother is, uh, I know him very well. I think I can handle that. And I said, well, what's your plan? My plan is, I'll make sure I go to sleep first. <laughs> Then my snoring will keep my brother awake. <laughs> but anyway, I said, okay, well, you know, it's up to you. So his brother came, and sure enough, sharing a small room together with his brother, his brother fell asleep first and started to snore. And that's a really small room, the monks' huts. So he started to snore. So he thought, oh my goodness, he didn't realize how loud his brother was when he was snoring. And so what he did was... First of all, he just was meditating, and then he remembered Ajahn Chah's teaching, it's not the noise disturbs you, it's you who disturb the noise. So what could he mean? So instead of disturbing the noise, instead of being negative to it, it was happening, he couldn't escape from it, so he made that the focus of his meditation. As I mentioned just before, and we had our lunch break. It's there, it's important, so you care for it. So he started changing his attitude towards his brother's snoring from something he was trying to escape from, adding all this negativity to it, until he started to notice his brother's snoring had a rhythm to it. It had a beat. <laughs> and it was... Uh, something, a type of music which he had never ever heard before. <laughs> and being a European, he started to imagine this was some really avant-garde uh, music, just without too much structure, but with a rhythm, with a beat, and it was breaking the boundaries of what we think as musical composition. Like many great, great musicians and, uh, have done before. And so after a while, just changing his perception of the, uh, the snoring, the snoring soon became, he said the last thing he remembered when he woke up in the morning, was just how beautiful that snoring was, and how melodious, and how he could see the amazing qualities which no musician had ever seen before. And he had a nice night's sleep. He changed his perception of the, of the snoring from something which was, was really negative, which kept him awake, to something which was beautiful and melodious. Wonderful way of doing it. So, that's what to do with your uh, roommate. Just change the snoring to something very melodious and beautiful. If that doesn't work, plan B is make sure you go to sleep first. <laughs> but we all snore. Once when I was doing a meditation, a day in a prison. Because it was a high security prison, I had to have a prison officer with me at all times. So he had to join in with the meditation session. There's only about seven or eight prisoners in there. And as we said, close your eyes, you know, watch your breath. And after about five minutes, I heard somebody snoring. It wasn't me, it wasn't one of the prisoners. It was a prison officer that brought him fast asleep. And as I opened my eyes, one of, one of the prisoners, his hand was about that far away from the officer's keys. <laughs> and as I opened my eyes, I gave him a dirty look. He said, oh, I jumped up. 
one more, about 10 more seconds, I'd have got those keys. <laughs> but out of respect for me, he just put his hand away. So, anyway, the snoring sometimes happens. If it does happen, just um, make that the object of your meditation. It's the most prominent thing, you can't avoid it. So, now's the most important time. What's in front of you is the most important thing in the world. And have this wonderful caring for you, embracing for it, embracing it. So embrace the snoring. Don't embrace the partner's neck. <laughs> <laughs> but embrace the, uh, the noise with care. Yes? Um, Venerable Bhante, can you please explain about Vipassana meditation and um, also to compare it with, you know, make a comment about the difference with Samatha? I'm not saying speak to the hand, that's really gross. Ajahn Chah will put his hand up like this, and he said, that's Samatha. So that's Vipassana. Now you can see Vipassana, you can't see Samatha. Now you can see Samatha, now you can't see Vipassana. They always go together. You can't have one without the other. So uh, because of that, that's what Ajahn Chah used to say. My simile is, there were these two uh, meditators in Australia. Uh, the guy, their partners, Sam and Vi. And they had a dog, Meta, and uh, they have a, another little dog called Anapana. And so Sam, of course, his, his second name was Atta. <laughs> Sam Atta and his partner Vi Pasana <laughs> met the dog and also Anapana. <laughs> they decided after lunch to have a walk up Meditation Mountain. And Sam went up there because Meditation Mountain was so peaceful, so calm. And Vi went up there because she had this wonderful Canon camera, not one of these iPhones which you always have to, you're always asking me, oh, just I've got it the wrong way around. I, well, hold on a minute, Ajahn Brahm, which button to press? A real camera, you know, the long lenses and stuff. She took that to take some insight shots because you could see forever up on, on top of Meditation Mountain. Meta the dog, what do dogs go up there for? They are far wiser than human beings. They just go up there for fun, for the joy of it. And Anapada went up there also because Anapada just wanted to disappear. <laughs> and so they went up to <laughs> they went up to Anap uh, to Samadhi Mountain, Meditation Mountain. And when they got even halfway up, wow, it was so peaceful. Even halfway up Meditation Mountain. Sam was just so happy. The peace there. But Sam also had a pair of eyes and could watch the view. You can see such a long distance. So his wife, Vi, she was taking all these incredible insight photos about, you know, which exposed the nature of the world in which they lived. And uh, Meta, the dog, Meta was really wagging her tail. She, Further you get up meditation out, you get so much love, and she was licking her fellow dog Anapana, and she was licking everybody and whacking her tail. She was so happy, Metta was really so happy halfway up meditation. And Anapana, the other dog, he was beginning to fade away, you could hardly find him. Anapana became so smooth. <laughs> but even the dogs could uh, appreciate the view and the, and the stillness. And when they got to the top of Meditation Mountain, wow, that was so tranquil, so still. Hardly anything moved. So Sam was there just enjoying the stillness. But he also had the eyes he could see forever on top of Meditation Mountain. Vi was collecting the, the photographs, but she could also experience the stillness. Met the dog. Oh, Meta was exploding in this beautiful golden light of loving kindness. You know, sometimes when the dogs are very happy, they wag their tail like it's going to fall off. That's what Meta was doing. Just incredible, powerful Meta. And as for Anapana, you couldn't find her. She disappeared. Because on the top of Meditation Mountain, Peace, credible insights, pure love, but the body and the breath 
and nowhere to be seen. That's what it's like up Meditation Mountain. You cannot separate Samatha Vipassana. And more importantly, you can't separate Samatha Vipassana and Metta. They all go together. So sometimes, when I teach meditation to beginners, sometimes I start with Anapanasati. If they can't do Anapanasati, then I teach them how to do breath meditation. If they can't do breath meditation, I teach them Vipassana. If they can't do Vipassana, I teach them insight meditation. Then if they have trouble with that, loving kindness meditation. And if they have difficulty with that, meta meditation. Then they can't do that, letting go meditation. If they can't do letting go meditation, then I teach them Anapanasati, by which time they can't remember that that's where they started off anyway. <laughs> <laughs> it's all the same. And I'm not saying that just uh, flippantly. That is very true. But you know what it is? Spiritual materialism. I do Vipassana. That's much more important than Samatha. No, Samatha rocks. No, I do the fast way to meditation. Please be careful. Because when, for those traditional Buddhists, the only way to enlightenment is Eightfold Path. You can't just take little bits out. It has to be Eightfold Path. That's the way. You don't do Vipassana. You don't do Samatha. If you do anything, you just make trouble. You stop doing things. And Vipassana does you. Samatha does you. Does you in. Your ego, your sense of self, vanishes. Like Anapana. Gone. Woohoo. Good riddance. <laughs> um, how to go from empathy to compassion? Empathy with those that suffer makes you suffer and thus not be able to help. Thanks. Oh, no. Instead of us and them. That's why... Uh, I haven't really explained it yet. But please, or during this retreat, or even every time I visit Melbourne, please don't take any, any selfies. This is a Buddhist society. We don't believe in self. <laughs> so you're only allowed to take we fees. <laughs> we, not me, not you, but us. And that was the old story of People getting married, it's not about the bride, it's not about the groom, it's not about the other person, it's not about me, it's always about us. So empathy. Okay, nice little story. The seven monks meditating in a cave. Some of you remember this, many of you don't. I'm surprised this, how people's memory just goes so quickly. <laughs> Now, seven monks went, now listen carefully, because this is interactive. I'm going to ask you a question about this. The seven monks were the head monk, the, the humdrum, that's, you know, the Sri Lankan way. The head monk, his brother was a monk. That's number two, the brother. The second monk was his best friend. They also ordained together. The fourth monk, enemy. They just didn't get on together. You know, you've seen that with monks and nuns. They're really good people, but sometimes that personality clashes, just like anywhere we try to do the best, but sometimes this, I don't know, personality clashes. So the fourth one was the enemy. The fifth monk was a very old monk. I mean really old. So old that we are going to die any day now. Whenever they went to do a blessing at the funeral parlor, they thought, what's the point of going home? You might as well stay there. <laughs> and the next monk was... The next monk was a very sick monk. He was so ill, he wasn't that old, but really ill, that no one knew who was going to die first, the old monk or the sick monk. And the last monk, number seven, was what we call the useless monk. He couldn't keep, couldn't keep his robe on properly. <coughs> Whenever he charged, it was always out of key. When he meditated, he fell asleep and snored. Could never you know, learn the chanting. Always just, you know, was there, but never could do anything really useful. He's just one of those people who just, you know, didn't have those abilities. He was a useless monk, but he was there anyway. So, seven monks in this cave in the jungle, 
And these band of robbers, these thieves, this gang, found that uh, cave in the jungle. And they thought, wow, this is such a secluded, remote, hidden cave. Just, if we could take this over, we could keep all our stolen goods here, and we could hide from the police until the heat went down, until they forgot about us because somebody else was in trouble. So, we could use this as a perfect hideout for us. But there's only one problem. The monks had found it first of all. So this was really an evil, desperate band of thieves. So they decided, let's just kill all these monks, get it over and done with. They were really bad people. But the head monk, be careful of head monks. They know how to talk. They could, as they sell, sell ice to Eskimos. They could... <laughs> so anyway, he talked to the... He said, look, why do you want to kill all the monks? Because we're afraid you'll tell the police your lo our location. No, we won't tell you. Look, we're honest, we keep our promises. How do I know that? And they eventually came to a compromise. And the compromise was... The gang of thieves wanted to kill one monk in front of all the others as a warning. This is what will happen to you if you tell the police where this cave is. And then you, know, the, you could go. But this is a warning to you. That was the only uh, bargain, or if you call it a bargain, the head monk could negotiate. One of the monks would have to die so the others could survive. So, the head monk had this choice. Who would be sacrificed so the others would go free? Now imagine you were that head monk. Who would you choose before you make your decision? Let's go through the options one more time. <laughs> there was the head monk. There was his brother. His brother would do anything for him. The next one was his best friend. His best friend would sacrifice their life for you. That's what a best friend is there for. They're always there for you, supporting you. The fourth monk was the enemy. It was a troublemaker. You know people, you know, just, oh, you know, phew, maybe this would be the opportunity to, you know, he could make some good karma and at the same time just leave everyone else alone. So the fourth monk was the enemy. The fifth monk was the old monk. I mean, he lived so long in this incarnation that, you know, that he was always going to die anyway soon. So, you know, just only a couple of days here, a couple of days there. Maybe the old monk was the solution. Going to die soon anyway. Or even better, the sick monk. You see, the sick monks are always never going to get better, always suffering, always in pain, always needing to... He couldn't do very much. His quality of life was not so great. And so maybe the, the old monk, no, the sick monk, could be a Or even better... The, the useless monk, the useless monk had never done any good karma in his life, just always just, you know, always been messing around, making mistakes, hopeless, never being able to do anything, disturbing the other monks when they were doing some chanting. Maybe the useless monk is opportunity to make some good karma. So, of those seven monks, if you were the head monk, and if you've heard the story before, read it, please shut up. <laughs> But if you haven't heard a story before, who do you think was chosen? So someone said the first monk, that means himself. If you agree with that, put your hand up. Come and have the courage of your convictions. <laughs> right, okay. You are all wrong. Any other suggestions? I don't hear the old monk. The old monk. Yeah, no, no, not the old monk, not the sick monk. Anyone for the stupid monk? Oh, you are <laughs> You know the story, Millie. The answer was, he couldn't choose. No way he could choose. Because the head monk's love and regard for his best friend was no more, no less than his love for his brother. He loved even the enemy. Exactly the same as the old monk, the sick monk, even the dear old useless monk. Well, I often say this, and Ayasuki, you would know this, every monastery has one. 
Just, some have too. <laughs> so, so they're all useless monks. And so, and most importantly, his love for himself was no more, no less than his love for all the other monks. He just, it was impossible. He just couldn't do it, he couldn't choose between himself and the others. His love for all was equal. And this is empathy and compassion. Why is it we sacrifice ourselves? We don't love ourselves as much as others. So we stand back, we look at everybody, just with the same caring eyes, ourselves as well. And I must say, I'm always a little bit sort of cheeky, because I remember doing, giving this story when I was in Sacramento and there was an uh, Episcopalian bishop, you know, came to my talk. And, you know, he was sitting down there, and I told that story, especially for him. You know what? I said, well, uh, I think we'll call a bishop. Uh, but he was uh, Afro American, so I, I couldn't really call him bro. <laughs> Sorry? Your, your highness? Okay, well, anyway. I said, well, what do you think? And of course, he said straight away, he sacrificed himself. And I was a bit cheeky. I said, ah, that's the wrong answer. <laughs> but then when I told him, the whole said, oh, yeah, I understand that. And I said, yeah, because your teacher, Jesus, didn't he say to love your neighbor as yourself? Didn't say more than yourself. Didn't say less than yourself. As yourself, no more, no less. I said, wow, that's really great. Can I use that in my sermons? Said, of course you can. <laughs> <laughs> Wisdom is not copyright. <laughs> so that's the answer, the empathy or compassion. You count as well. So you stand back, you put yourself in the balance as well, and others. And that means you have your answer. Okay, next question. But! I interrupt because people say, well, what happened next? <laughs> and the answer is that when the head monk explained to the leader of the gang of robbers why he couldn't choose, the leader was so impressed that not only did he let the monks go, but half the monks stopped being robbers and ordained and became monks, and the other half went back to their village and got a, got a proper job. And that is a very loose translation, interpretation of the story of Talaputa Tera in the Teragata. Very loose. <laughs> <laughs> but that's what happened in that story. Uh, dear Ajahn Brahm, when meditating, my body tends to vibrate. Do I continue to observe this and let it continue? I thought eventually we are to let any sensation go. Yeah, but it, you let it go, you don't make it go. So it's vibrating, just go for it. You know, like, that can be very, very sort of good exercise. You know, sometimes if you've got a bit of tummy on here, to, to vibrate that will be really, really good. So it gets in there. Oh yeah, go for it. Just let it vibrate. It must have been you're probably connected with your past life as a rock and roller. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, yeah, just no. If it's look, when you have weird body movements, don't interrupt it. Just let it happen. Because a lot of times it's you know the, your body just accommodating. Knows your body knows how to heal itself. You get involved and you always mess it up. Just let it go and just, just watch. This is very interesting. And then see what happens. But don't be afraid. Don't encourage it. Don't stop it. Just have this beautiful equanimous attitude. Oh, this is interesting. See what happens. Yes. Okay. I meditate leaning against the back of a chair and with shoulders slumped forward. But sometimes this leads to sleepiness. I have tried holding my back and shoulders straight but then I can't relax fully into meditation. Please advise any ideas you may have to resolve my dilemma. Okay. Yep. 
So they do have a special chair that was invented in the United States. It's called the electric chair. <laughs> <laughs> They're so advanced, they invented the electric toothbrush, the electric shaver, the <laughs> electric, electric car, electric chair by Tesla. <laughs> <laughs> no, lean back and go to sleep. It's more important you go to sleep than you feel tense. So you lean back. In fact, you know, there's always um, some uh, osteopaths and physiotherapists who, you know, uh, learn meditation and teach it to some of their followers. And it's been well known that the most comfortable, healthiest position for your back is about 15 degrees from the vertical. Exactly the inclination of the backrest of your chair. That chair has like evolved. You know, of customer satisfaction, they found out that that particular angle on the back is the most comfortable and healthiest for you. That's why you fall asleep, because at last you have the chance to relax. So, I just got used to this, I'm comfortable just sitting on a, a cushion. But, if you want to go lean back, do so. Yeah, you go asleep at first, but after a while, you know, your, your sleepiness, your sleep deficit will be paid off. And then you can actually meditate very, very peacefully and happily. Of course, in this room is a little bit warm for some of us. So, if you know, you're very sleepy, just and you've got an extra blanket on, or shawl, take the shawl off. Take the jacket off, take the scarf off. And then you're not so sleepy, you're more like alive. But, you know, if you're not comfortable, if you're already cold, then fine, you can keep the shawl on. But, eventually, that sort of tiredness vanishes. And then you get a nice peaceful meditation. Yes. <laughs> when I walk, I like to make it a walking meditation. Most times I struggle to get rid of tunes in my head. Tune? What tunes? What tunes? Uh, if it is Namo Tassa Bhagavato, that's a good tune. Or Sadhu, Sadhu, Sadhu. That's a nice tune. But when you're walking, tunes in the head. Sometimes, do you've got tunes in the head all the time? Why is it when you walk, you have tunes in the head? It's a lot of times it's because you've got nothing to focus on and so you look at something, you go searching in your data bag of uh, interesting or rather uh, things to do to waste time. It's the same reason why you have music in elevators, music in airports. You just can't do anything without hearing some music somewhere. Even you go on the aircraft, you just go and sit down and there's music straight away. So there's music almost everywhere. So, it's because people get afraid of silence. They don't know what to do when there's just no music at all. Because if there's no music, you're just fronting yourself and you're not really it's out of your comfort zone. Oh my goodness, I have to be with me. I'm not sure if I really want to be with me. I'd rather be with Jimi Hendrix or Celine Dion, or <laughs> who else, I don't know. No, you don't want to be with Celine Dion. Cause she, cause I know Celine Dion, simply because that when you go to funeral services, they always play the theme from Titanic. <laughs> Our love will go on, or whatever it is. <laughs> and isn't it bad enough losing your loved one and just thinking the ship's gone down as well and your life is ended? <laughs> Crikey, people just so depressive. <laughs> good afternoon, Arjun. Can okay, you yeah. please advise how to have a good memory? What should we do? Thank you, Arjun. Uh, what was the first part of that question? Um. <laughs> <laughs> That's a joke. Oh. <laughs> you know what? I've been waiting for him. <laughs> to play a trick on me for the last uh, five days. Yeah, and, uh, and I'm so thankful it's here, <laughs> not up on stage. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, I have to have a good memory. Who wants a good memory anyway? What's so great about having a great memory? I was um, 
giving a session. I got all sorts of interesting sort of conferences. This was on, on dementia, Alzheimer's and dementia conference. And I uh, had a sort of a doctor specialist who was presenting alongside of me. And then he started saying some of the symptoms of dementia. You know, some of the symptoms of dementia, you can't remember the past, you can't really plan for the future, and you become a little bit antisocial. You know, you like being by yourself instead of with others. I thought, oh my goodness, I've been teaching people to do that for the last 35 years. <laughs> Let go of the past, don't worry about the future. <laughs> Stay by yourself in solitude. <laughs> so I'm one of the causes of dementia problem in Australia. <laughs> but, but why do you need a good memory? Sometimes I always like questioning, seeing things from another angle. So, okay, remember the good things. That's really important. But why is it that when we lose our memory, we lose our memory of the good things, we still carry on remembering the bad stuff? It's absolutely crazy. You know, what somebody said about us, what somebody did to us, they cheated us, they abused us, they hurt us. Why can't we let go of those memories? The reason is because they define who we are. That's our identity. That's our past. I remember this because, again, another conference I was giving was on grief and loss many years ago. And maybe that uh, in Victoria, you don't, this is not as important as West Australia. In West Australia, oh, about 20 years ago, there was a group of murders they call the Claremont Serial Killings. Apparently they find the guy now after 20 years. And how they think they have. I don't think the trial's come up yet, but they're pretty sure. And anyway, they had this grief and loss conference. There was a mother of one of those um, unsolved uh, victim, unsolved murder victims. And I think her, the body had been dug up in Kings Park, but they didn't know who did it. And of course, you know, can you imagine you're being a mother? There's a girl in the prime of her life, young, going out, and she just was killed, murdered, and no one could find out why. And so this lady went to every grief and loss conference. And when I gave my presentation on how to deal with grief and loss, she got really angry. And she came up to me after the presentation, like nose to nose, breathing fire at me. And I remember what she said, how dare you presume to take away my grief? And wow. I was shocked, but thank you for showing that she was a famous griever. And she could get entry to many, many conferences. And it gave her some sympathy. She was important as a mother of a daughter who was killed in famous circumstances. It gave her an, a, a sense of self. And she got much sympathy from that. It gave her meaning. And from that it opened up a lot of why people will not let go of grief and anger, revenge. Because if they let that go, they've got nothing left to define themselves. Their sense of self is gone. <coughs> and they're not used to that. So that's one of the reasons why that we can't let go of the past is the, the victim identity. Be careful of that. You know, you can justify it, but you become a prisoner of it. So it's wonderful when you can let those things go. And you keep the good memories, the happy times. Every time I go to somebody's house, you see their photographs, the photographs of them on holiday in some exotic location, you see a photograph with their kids, or with their dogs, or with their, on a retreat somewhere. I always have it when they graduate from university, throwing up their caps, wearing stupid clothing they never wear again. And anyway, they, I've never seen yet a photograph of somebody who was sitting there doing exams. <laughs> graduating, yes. Seen people on holiday, never seen people photographed when they're 
they're caught in a traffic jam on the way to work. Seeing people just <laughs> on holiday but never seeing them sick in a hospital, having a photograph taken with all tubes all over the place. They never put that on the wall of their house. You see people, their marriage. Oh, well, I don't know, that's past century, but I've never seen that. <laughs> I'm not that old. <laughs> okay, yeah. But anyway, but anyway. <laughs> you, you always keep the good photographs. I see many people, their marriage. That's a very common, see their marriage in a, on the wall there, your husband and your relations and stuff. Is that what you mean by having photographs with dead people? <laughs> No, no. But you never have photographs of your divorce settlement. <laughs> you don't see that on people's walls. In other words, you only have the happy photographs. You have those because that reminds you, it uplifts you, it sort of gives you there's enough suffering in this world, so it gives you some memory that happiness is possible. And there it was, happy moments of life. Those are the memories we should keep. The bad memories. Delete, 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 delete. So that's one of the reasons why. Why, why do we, can't we forget what is worth forgetting? And keep what is worth keeping. So our memory is efficient and not full of rubbish. Empty out the trash cans of your memory bank. You'll have a much happier life. Okay. I don't know if that answered the question because I can't really remember what it was. Dear Arjan, can you please explain merit and sharing transfer? Thank you. Merits and sharing of merits. Merits is when you do a wonderful, good act, like laughing at Ajahn Brahm's jokes, which makes me happy. <laughs> <laughs> and supporting uh, nuns monasteries and monks monasteries, especially at NBM. We worked so hard for this over many years. I, I be, how long have I been coming here? 35 years? I remember when I first came here, Frank was this really young man, <laughs> wet behind his ears, had forehead of hair, and this was, yeah. <laughs> about over 30 years, because when we had Richmond, Tem Richmond and her, Temple, Mary Street. Where was that? Where did you move from there? Because it was before. Yeah, it's a long time ago. But see, my memory's not that bad. <laughs> but <laughs> the happy times, memories over there. So anyway, I remember that temple, and so we're always looking to to have instead of having to import your monks and nuns from the west, have homegrown, homegrown, high quality with Ajahn Brahm QC stamp on them. So that's why we decided to build NBM, New Bee Buddhist Monastery. But it is so hard to build stuff. You need this, with this permission and that permission and all sorts of, as they say right now, they need to have you know, really special sewers because there's an attachment area. And somebody else said, but look at all those cows and sheep, they're pooing all over the place. They don't need sort of sewers. <laughs> that's going all over the ground. So anyway, we have to do all of that, so they're still uh, hoping to get some more funds. And so this is where you make merit. It's called letting go. And research has shown that conclusively that people who earn too much money, and it's only oh, some years ago, it's for a family, it's about like maybe over 100,000 uh, income, I think together, you know, a year. It just, it's really difficult. There's an optimum income. If you're earning more than that, it's just a worry investing it and what happens, you invest it in the banks and they just take most of the money, they give you bad advice. I was reading that in the, in the newspapers, all the four banks, you know, the big Royal Commission into just how they screw you over with your investments and never give you good advice. So you can't trust them, but you can trust the BSV. <laughs> Good investment strategy of happiness. And it's true because every time you give something, you're kind, and you see the results of it. 
That's why, you know, ooh, a few days ago, to see in, in Melbourne your own BSV monastery start to take shape. Wow, it's actually happening. It's inspiring. And it's marvelous to actually to do something like that. So, that is where you can make merit. And check out the monks and nuns. Check out their accommodation. Every year, when we have our uh, entry to the rain stay, or uh, the start of the was or the katina, we have uh, guided tours in Bodhinyana Monastery. The doors are open. You can actually go inside the monks' huts and see you know, how they live. So check out, are there any, under the beds, any copies of Playboy? <laughs> no. <laughs> any, and actually see. So, you know, we, and you can, my hut, my bedroom, is a tourist attraction. It's a cave. And you just got a mat on the floor, and it's hardly got anything in there. I love that, it's simple. And, you know, people say, what, are you living here? Or is it just, just for show? No, I live there. <laughs> and we're not here, obviously. But probably today there's somebody just having a squiz and see what is in there. But I always thought, if I need to make some more funds for, for Bodhinyana Monastery, what I need to do, I can actually hire that out. Airbnb. <laughs> at your <Bud's> caves. <laughs> no, it won't be any Airbnb. No, this is like, you know, a really good monk's cave. You can, you know, for one day, two days. Uh, it really costs you, because this is very unique. Airbnb. Would you like to go in Airbnb, live in Ajahn Bob's cave? <laughs> nice and quiet. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> Airbnb. But of course you have some sort of requirements there, which you have to shave your hair off and <laughs> put a brown robe. <laughs> but anyway, no, that's... Um, so it's nice because I just... Sometimes you get really disappointed when you see, like, monks. They just got milli literally millions in their own accounts and they just waste it in all sorts of stupid stuff. So that's why I will not be the spiritual advisor of the BSV if you went down that path of just, you know, just uh, soliciting for and put people's names on the board. That this kuti was built by, by the live conquest. <laughs> that's not how we do things. It's when you give offerings, it's expecting nothing back in return. Anonymous, you don't know who gave what. I say at that what I said about the huge donation for the nuns monastery in in uh, in Perth, which started the whole thing off, quarter of a million dollars. To an, I never seen such a big check, and sometimes uh, I didn't know who it was. I still don't know his name. Where did he go? But anyway, that's really that was inspires you. So that's merit making. Now sometimes the transfer of some merits. You may have like a father or mother who's no longer here. And actually, you know the, uh, this is true, you know the, that first book I wrote, The Opening of the Door of Your Heart? That was, obviously I get royalties from that, that's sold. It's been a really big bestseller. So, as a monk, I can't do anything for myself. So I said, where do you want the royalties to go? And that was actually the time we were building Dhammasara Monastery. So, oh, oh no, that was for the hall at Dhammaloka Monastery. The next book, Good, Bad, Who Knows? Those royalties go to Dhammasara. So they said, uh, put it for a new hall at uh, our centre in Perth. And I said, I'm going to dedicate those merits for my father. So all the, the stuff which comes from opening the door of your heart, all the royalties, that's for my dad. The one who taught me opening the door of your heart. And that makes me feel so great. Because every time you get a royalty check, which goes to, not never to me, but our Buddhist society of West Australia, you think, wow, this is good karma for my dad. And you can see the connection. And if it wasn't for him, I wouldn't have learned so much. It had such a good start. And he deserves it. So I think, well done, Dad. You know I can still picture him. 
still, you know, this young man from Liverpool, just really, I don't mind me, I'm going, it's supposed to be meditation, it's Ajahn Brahm's uh, old memories time, but he was one who, uh, he wasn't honest, never taught me honesty, but certainly he taught me love and sacrifice, because I, at the age of 11 years of age, I got a place in a school soccer team, primary school. I said, Dad, Dad, I've got a place in the school soccer team. I said, well, when are you playing? Saturday morning. I've got to work Saturday morning. I was so disappointed. You know, as a son, you got a place in the school soccer team and your dad couldn't see you play. But then, Saturday morning, there I was playing and I looked by the sideline and there was my dad cheering me on. And that just gave me so much of a boost. And I asked him afterwards, how did you do that? That's what you were working today. Well, yeah. Um, I told my boss, because I, I am sick, that I have to have a series of injections on Saturday mornings for the next nine weeks. <laughs> <laughs> he was lying. <laughs> but, you know, <laughs> yeah, it was a lie, but that way he could see his son play soccer. And to me, that was forgivable. And that, of course, meant so much. The sacrifice of a father for son. Can I make a comment? Yeah. I think that's um, particularly poignant when you were talking about him the other night yeah. um, and about his childhood oh, and yes, what yeah. had happened to him. So he really yeah. did learn how to accept, forgive Ooh. and learn, didn't yeah, he? Yeah, absolutely. And just uh, the sort of stuff which you remember. We always remember our fathers. and If you've got a good one, oh, they're just like a, such a mentor. And it's also that that's why it's not lovely to give merit to somebody like that. And my mum as well, my grandma, grandfather, all the people you've known and loved. So it feels wonderful. So when you do something, you give some good karma. It's, it's not just for you, it's for them. And even if, if your mother you know, was a really, really devout Christian, you don't make merit by giving, giving it to the Buddhist society. Give it to the, the church. What would make them happy? What would they would really love you to do? And say, Mom, you know, that church always said was too cold. I sponsored heating for it. And so that's for you, Mum. So it's not for you, it's for, for the person who passed away. So that's that's what I like. That's a sharing of merit. It's very beautiful. Just um, one last question. Is there is there such a thing as a last yeah, question? Yeah. There's just one here. Well, for this, for yeah, okay. now, anyway. Okay. Um, dear Ajahn Brahm, I always do my best to be a kind and honourable human being. However, sometimes I feel like I'm being psychologically attacked by a family member. How do I manage this? Thank you. Oh, it's easy. Learn the evil eye. <laughs> no, you don't learn the evil eye. <laughs> Psychologically attacked by a family member. They just learn your buttons and they try and press them, try and have no buttons. <sighs> okay, one of the stories. This was not a family member, but I was with my mum visiting and she was making my lunch. And lunches were very important for monks, especially when I was very thin many years ago. Actually, I was thin, you know. I got photographs to prove it. <laughs> <laughs> so, so... There was a, uh, the doorbell rang. So I said, Mum, don't spoil my lunch, I'll answer it for you. It wasn't, so, it wasn't really compassion for my mum, it was like compassion for my tummy. So I don't want you to be disturbed, spoil my lunch. So I went to the door, opened it, and there was this uh, lady selling knickknacks door to door. And if, you, if you've come from sort of uh, England, it was called like the Romany community, the gypsies, I used to call them. They said, do you want to buy this little sprig of heather? I said, no, thank you very much. I was very polite. And then she looked at me and said, if you don't buy this sprig of heather, I'll put a gypsy curse on you. She said that to me. And that was their marketing technique. But they didn't realize who they were dealing with because I was a senior Buddhist monk. I was in my robe and I really stood tall and I said to her, don't you realize I am a fully ordained Buddhist monk? of many, many years, good meditation teacher, my curses are far stronger than yours. <laughs> That's what I said to her. 
I don't know, I still really don't know whether I should have done that or not. <laughs> but it's, it certainly worked. <laughs> Her face dropped, she looked so frightened. She turned around and ran away. <laughs> Of course, you don't have any curses. You know, if you did have them, you wouldn't curse anybody anyway. So, but she didn't know that. And it taught her a little lesson. <laughs> you shouldn't you know, threaten to curse anybody, use psychological pressure on anybody. And anyway, you can be much stronger. So if you learn about meditation, learn about your mind, learn about yourself, oh, it's just so, uh, people can't have psychological pressure on you. Because psychological psychological pressure on what? So after a while, it's just you have your fears, things you haven't admitted yet. Just admit, you know what you are. Done any small things which are wrong, and so they can't sort of blackmail you, physically, psychologically, or whatever. So anyway, that's it, is it?